If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Jonah. To the book of Jonah. I don't do a lot of books on Wednesday night, but uh, I've been reading through the Bible again, and I ran into this a couple of weeks ago, and uh, just some things stuck out in my mind. I know y'all know uh, most of the story, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to remind you of some things uh, that will help you also. Uh, Tonight I want to talk to you, and we're going to do it a chapter at a time. I'm going to do chapter one tonight and then chapter two the next week, so it'll be four weeks of studying the book of Jonah. And tonight we're talking about running from God, running from God. And uh, folks, you shouldn't be surprised, uh, you know, when you listen to that, it almost seems you know, like a bad thing, which again, it's, it is a bad thing. But what I'm trying to say is I think there are people running from God and they don't even know it. Okay. They are not as close to God as they used to be. Uh, They are not doing the things that they know they need to be doing. Uh, So let me give you the outline here. Uh, Number one, Jonah's disobedience. Jonah's disobedience. Number two, Jonah's sin affected everyone. One is Jonah's disobedience. Jonah's sin affected everyone. And folks, that is so true. I'll, I'll share that with you in just a few minutes. And number three, God's discipline on Jonah. God's discipline on Jonah. You know, Jonah was a prophet of God from Gath Hefer in Zebulun who ministered to the northern kingdom of Israel in the days of Jeroboam II. It was a time of great prosperity and peace in Israel. But it was also a time of moral and spiritual decay as Israel rebelled against God and worshipped idols. And that's certainly what's going on in America today. The book of Jonah speaks loudly on the depth of God's grace and mercy. Uh, Jonah also learned about the love of God and God's compassion for the lost people. The book of Jonah mentions a great fish four times, a great city, which was Nineveh nine times, a disobedient prophet 18 times, and God is mentioned 38 times in the book of Jonah, uh, which is the most important factor in our story. So with that in mind, let's look at Jonah 1, verse 1. And by the way, this this is a true story. Uh, There are people, and again, not biblical scholars, but they they think it's an allegory, and uh, even some use the word parable. Uh, But uh, we know uh, that this is a true story. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amatite, I can't say that right, saying, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come before me. But Jonah rose uh, to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship to go to Tarshish, So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with him to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. The first thing you can see in verse 1 is the word of the Lord came to uh, Jonah, which again, he knows the call of God. If you are a prophet, you know when God is speaking to you. So God was directly talking to him, and he had a specific thing God wanted him to do. And we see... Uh, you know, him just basically rebelling. He's just basically saying, you know, I'm not going, okay? And there was a couple of reasons from that for that. Uh, one uh, was just, you know, the, the Assyrians uh, were enemies of Israel. And, uh, you know, he, he had the attitude uh, there that, you know, these are Gentiles. Uh, these are, you know, uh, even the Assyrians were known for their fierceness and their their war tactics, and they were brutal and they were harsh. And so he kind of had an attitude. And matter of fact, I jotted this down this morning. I was going over it again uh, after I had written this on Monday. Uh, you know, the first thing he had an attitude about was his call, God's call. He had an attitude about that. All right, the second thing, was God's mission, God's call and God's mission. And the third thing he had an attitude about is God's will. 
And I think the overriding theme also in Jonah is God's will. Are we going to do God's will and what God asks us to do? And when it says great city, it means it's a huge city. There was an estimation that I'd read in one of the commentaries where it could have been as many as 100,000 people. And being Assyrians, okay, being Gentiles, they uh, had probably not, uh, and, and they certainly wouldn't uh, serve Jehovah God of the Bible. So we are talking about a mission field. We're talking about people that need to be saved. Uh, we're talking about people you know, that didn't know God's law per se. And so uh, God always has a purpose. God has a will for our lives. And God's will was for him to go to Nineveh. Uh, but he disobeyed. And I like the, the where it says, uh, in, he says, so he paid the fare and went down into it. And we all know that, you know, you know getting on a ship and going somewhere costs you money. And so even at that, that choice that he made there uh, was not. And really, you talk about the right of your life, all right? Uh, he probably wished he was back on that ship, you know, uh, because we know uh, the rest of the story. And the last part of verse 3 is the one that really gets to me personally. He went down into the ship and, and away from the presence of the Lord. Folks, when we're running from God, we are running from his presence. And that is totally opposite of what we should be doing. Okay? Uh, growing Christian, we, we long for the presence of God. We long for fellowship with God. Uh, we want to know God. We want to worship God. Uh, we want to be faithful to God in all that we do. Uh, so you could see Jonah making several mistakes here in this first part. Hold your finger there and go to 1 Samuel 15. Uh, there's several, uh, you know, in several examples in the Old Testament of, of people that just basically did not do what the Word of God said. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15, uh, you remember uh, Samuel told Saul, the new king of Israel, to go fight the Amalekites. And he said not only fight them, he said destroy them. Okay, some of the battles that they had in the Old Testament, all right, you could take, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, things there. You could take animals. You could take, you know, gold. You could take some silver. Uh, but this particular time, uh, God told him through Samuel, "You destroy the kings. You destroy everything." And uh, and we don't have time to read the first nineteen verses, but that's basically what was going on. And Saul in his mind and by the response that you hear, he basically told Samuel, in his mind, he, he did what God had told him to do. When Samuel knew uh, that that is not what, he, what he'd heard. Matter of fact, you know, when he was telling him this, he heard the sheep, you know, uh, you know sounding off, you know, in the background. And he says, what am I hearing there? You know, you, you know, he's, you know the king Saul was trying to say, I, I, I've done what? And that's the other thing, folks. Sometimes when we're out of the will of God, we don't even realize that we are sinning. It doesn't even, even though I know the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, but there's, when, when we're running from God, uh, that, that fellowship, and again, you're not lost. It's, it's, it, your relationship with God is always, we believe in once saved, always saved. But you're not as in tune with God and sometimes he's trying to speak to you, but you are not listening to what he's saying. Look at verse 20 there. And Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. In his mind, he thought he had done it and gone on the mission which the Lord has sent me and brought back Agag, the king of the Amalekites. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites, but the people took the plunder, the sheep and the oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And basically, he would not own up to it. Okay, He was the one that was told. He was the king. He could have told them, take that stuff back. We're not supposed to have any of this. Another story in the Bible, remember Achan and what happened with Achan. Okay, there. And not only did he... Uh, not tell them to take the stuff back. Then he tried to spiritualize it. 
He tried to say, hey, we're going to make sacrifices to God. So, folks, you can justify things in your own mind, but when God tells you to do something, and it's like, it's like the Word of God, it's either right or wrong, folks. As a Christian, I don't have to sit around and think, well, I wonder if that's right. Okay, we should be close to God and intimate with God and uh, knowing God and having fellowship with God to know his word and to know what's right and what's wrong. And then Samuel said to Saul, has the Lord great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? He was thinking if he made these sacrifices that everything would be all right. But folks, you have to do things God's way. When God tells you to do it, there's no turning back. There's no negotiating with him. Okay? Then the key is right here. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Yes, God, in those days, liked the sacrifice, and it was a pleasing aroma, you know, the Old Testament says, but not the way this was done. He was saying, you obey God first, and then you can sacrifice. And to heed then the fat of rams, now here's the verse, for rebellion is as sin as witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And when we see those two words, witch, witchcraft and idolatry, you know what we say, man, I ain't doing neither one of those. But he is comparing the sin of rebellion, being disobedient to those things. And folks, sin is sin is basically what he's trying to to say, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. And again, in Achan's case, it cost him his life and the life of his family. And, and again, in the New Testament, you can see Ananias and Sapphira and, and what happened there. So Jonah totally disobeyed God. And the second thing, Jonah's sin affected everyone. Because here's what I hear every now and I'm talking to someone, when it's my sin, you know, I can do what I want, okay? It's not bothering anybody else. If I want to do this, I can do this, okay? And, and folks, that is a terrible attitude to have about sin. Sin is wrong, and we as Christians need to stay away from sin. Look at verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, and, uh, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Folks, I'm telling you, God can use everything, okay? You can see in the New Testament, Jesus, he, the winds and the waves obeyed him. God brought this about, and I believe he was trying to get his attention at this point. Then the mariners were afraid. Now think of that. These are sailors, folks. These are people that have been in these situations before. And so it wasn't, tempt us is, means it was a great storm. It was a huge storm uh, in modern time. It, it, a mighty tempest of the sea that the ship was about to be broken up. The mariners were afraid, and every man cried to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. And it's kind of like sailors, you know, you know, they're rough, and, you know, they have known, you know, I, I've heard the phrase, cuss like a sailor, as I was growing up. But when they are scared and when they realize that, man, we're in big trouble, they're, notice the, the God, it's a little g, which means... These were pagans, folks. These, these were not saved folks, and these were not saved sailors. But they were so scared, even they were crying out to their little gods. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the ship and laid down and was fast asleep. I find that real interesting, okay? One, maybe he was tired, okay? But I don't think, I think he was trying to hide from God and hide from God, and, and he fell asleep there and even at that, uh, you know, sometimes if we get in a sin pattern, it, it, it's almost like we become calloused to things. What used to bother us, you know, you know, you just, it's just like if you sin and you get in this habit of sin, it gets where, you know, maybe you don't even come under conviction of it because you, you're just in this pattern and you're not sensitive to the Holy Spirit like you should be. Verse 6, so the captain came to him and said, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise and call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us and so that we may not perish. Everyone was scared. Everyone was crying out to God and, and he was asleep and not doing anything. He wasn't praying, being a prophet of God. 
And in verse 7, and they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. And again, casting lots, you know, the best thing I can compare it to is dice. And it's, it's just an Old Testament thing. It kind of reminds me of wives, okay? In the Old Testament, I mean, they had several wives. Not, I mean, it's not right now, you know, gambling or however you want to say it, but that was just the way it was back then. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And, and you know, basically, obviously, you know, uh, he was guilty of what they were saying. And then they said to him, please tell us, for whose cause is this a trouble upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? Man, they wanted to know the story. They were in dire straits. They were afraid of losing their life. And so they start grilling him about who he was and what he is doing and what he has done. They might have even thought he was some kind of criminal, all right? And God was uh, bringing justice on a criminal. And then in verse 9, it says, So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Folks, he knew because he was a prophet of God, because he was Jewish, uh, because at one time, you know, he was close to God and he spoke the word and he said, thus saith the Lord. I mean, he basically, uh, you know, they called his hand and they knew something was wrong with this guy uh, because he was the only one not being afraid. And he was admitting, you know, that I fear the Lord. I love the Lord. All right, but again, you notice he didn't just start spilling his guts about everything that was going on, okay? And folks, sometimes that's the way it is uh, with sin. You know, we'll, we'll say, well, you know, I, I might have done that or I could have had an attitude or I, you know, and instead of just fessing up right away, okay, and, and just admitting it to God and moving on, uh, sometimes we, we hide our sin, sometimes we will not admit that it's sin. Sometimes, even when we're called in on it, we'll lie about sin. And folks, you know, you just can't do that as a Christian. Um, you know, your, your sin is going to be found out. And the whole deal, too, is, folks, God sees everything. God knows everything, and He knows what is going on. Um, and when it says Jonah's sin affected everyone, folks, everybody on that ship was in danger because of Jonah, because of him running from God, because of his rebellion. And folks, that can happen in our own lives. If I, for some crazy reason, uh, did something to break a law and, and you know, uh, my name showed up in the paper the next day and pastor of Rye Hill, you know, I, I hate to even think of how many people that would affect. I mean, not just our congregation, I've been in this city for 18 years. I, I go places, and I, I truly hear this, and Steve's with us sometimes, me, sometimes when they say that. You know, I know who you are. You're the pastor at Rye Hill. And if I do something crazy and stupid like that, you know, it's going to affect our church. It's going to affect my family. It's going to affect my kids. And it's going to affect, and, and that's the thing, even with our youth and our children, I don't want to let them down, okay? And so we always, we can't take the idea, it's meant my life and I, I want to do. And folks, I'm telling you, there are many a person, pastors or persons that have walked away from ministry. They have, they have just said, you know, hey, I, I'm not doing it anymore. Or they've been caught in adultery or these things. And folks, I'm telling you, it affects everyone around you. And a lot of people just say, it's my sin and I need to deal with it and you need to get over it. You know, and, and folks, that is not the attitude to have. I'm not saying Jonah was that way. I'm just saying that, that it, it's a serious thing. You know, when you are running from God and your sin affects others. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3. And folks, you know the story, Adam and Eve. I mean, they, they did the wrong thing. Eve got into conversation with, with the devil and 
Folks, when you start talking to him, you're, you're, there's a good chance when you start that conversation with him, uh, something bad is going to happen. Folks, we need to rebuke him. We need to you know, tell him to get behind us, get away from us. All right, Your conversation needs to be with God and let God take care of Satan. But uh, verse 8 is where I want to pick up. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Notice the same word was used in, jo used in Jonah, from the presence of the Lord. They had one job to do. They had one thing to avoid, but they could not do that. Then the Lord God called out to Adam and said, where are you? Not that he didn't know where he was. God knew exactly where he was. He just wanted Adam to acknowledge that he was hiding from God. And folks, we can't hide. You can run. You can change your name. You can relocate. You can do a lot of things. But God knows where you are and what you are about. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. When does fear come into his life? Okay, when he disobeys God, when they take a bite of the fruit. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? And I mean, God calls his hand right there. Have you done this? And notice what he says. Then the man said, the woman whom you gave with me, she gave me the tr of the tree and I ate it. You know what I call this? The blame game. The blame game. It ain't my fault. Man, she, she was talking to him. She took a bite first. It's not my fault. Oh, man, all I can say is he needs to man up and admit it, folks. He needs to. And then it says, and the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So how does she blame it on? She blames it on the serpent. All right, it's, it's just, you know, everybody wants to play, play the game, uh, uh, the, the blame game. But here's the deal. You talk about sin affecting someone. Their sin affected all of mankind. You just think about that. The very first in the Word affected all of mankind. And I say that to say, never take sin lightly. And what we do, and we're bad about this, we compare ourselves to somebody else and we convince ourselves that we're okay or that we're better than that person. So if I'm better than that person, then I'm okay. Folks, our sin is our sin. Our walk with God is our walk with God. Your walk with God is not maybe what some other person's walk with God is. So we don't need to play the blame game. We don't need to, to say it's not sin because it really is. So we see Jonah's disobedience. Jonah's sin affected everyone. And number three, God's discipline on Jonah. And the men were exceedingly afraid. No, notice before it was just afraid. Now it's exceedingly afraid. And he said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. He finally spills his guts, okay? Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was groaning, uh, growing more temptuous. I think it's amazing that sailors that don't even know God was trying to do the right thing, okay? They were trying to do the, the right thing. And, and you, you, we're talking about lost people, okay? People that didn't know God. Here was a servant of God, a prophet of God, running for God, doing the wrong thing. Then verse 12, and it, it gets even better. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know this is the greatest tempest is because of me. He got honest. I even, one of the, one of the uh, commentaries said, you know, he was committing suicide. And, you know, I, I don't think that was it at all. I don't think that's what, what he was trying to do, okay? Which tells you, folks, when you read commentaries, and, and I, I am for commentaries, but you have to filter it. You have to use the Holy Spirit, okay, with that. Basically, he was saying, God spoke to him and he says, here's what you need to do. This, this is what's going to stop the problem. Verse 13, nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more temptuous again. 
So they were even trying to do the right thing. They didn't want to toss him over. They had a conscience, okay? And they were trying. Do you see just the flip of who we're talking about? We're talking about lost sailors versus a prophet of God, all right? Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with this innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as you was pleased. Even them, they were trying to do the right thing. They didn't want his blood on their conscience. So they picked him up. Uh, so they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea sifts, uh, ceased from raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now again, I'm not saying... Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the writers that I read said, you know, that they themselves had a come-to-God meeting. And I don't see that. I don't see Jonah. Uh, you know, and, and again, between the lines, you know, you, you can think what you want or read what you want. But I think they realized that, man, there is a God. Because you just think about this. One minute they are fearing for their lives. In the next minute, and folks, I believe it happened this quick. When Jonah's body hit the water, I think it just went calm. And so they knew, man, there is something to this. We, we have been sailors for 40 years, and we have never seen that happen, ever. And folks, again, God uses nature to teach a story. And they did, and again, when I, when I think they offered sacrifice, and I understand it says to the Lord and took vows, again, I, I just, you know, my opinion is, I, I don't know. I'm just going to honestly say, I don't know. But it made a huge impression on them. Matter of fact, <laughs> if you really get down to it, the sailors were being more spiritual than Jonah himself, which, again, is just crazy. Verse 17, now the Lord had pre uh, prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So what was the discipline? All right, you, you know, you ran from, you paid, you know, you paid, you wanted to uh, get on a ship, you wanted to hide from God, you paid the fare, you lost your money. I told you to go north and you went south. I'm just going to chunk you out there and see how that works for you, okay? And again, folks, don't remember, not all sin is because we have done something wrong, okay? A lot of, some things is, is what I'm not saying, but not all discipline, I said that wrong. Not all discipline is because, you know, we've done something wrong. I mean, there is discipline when we sin, but there are just life issues. For instance, sometimes I counsel people and they talk to me and they just said, this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened. And I think God's mad at me. Okay, what are you basing that on is my first question. Okay, and again, nobody's perfect. I understand all that. But sometimes it's just life. Just, just this week, okay? What did I, since Sunday, what did I ask you to do? I asked you to pray that Lori wouldn't have to have surgery. What did God choose? She's having surgery, okay? It's life, folks, all right? It wasn't that God wasn't listening to us. It wasn't that God wasn't mad at us or mad at Lori. She fell. People fall. People get hurt. So you just go to the doctor. You do what the doctor says, and you're done with it. And life is that way. Don't always think God's mad at you because the truth of the matter is, Romans chapter 8, bad things happen to good people. It's life, okay? It's life. But we know that all things, what? Work together for good to those who, what? Love the Lord and those who are called according to his purpose. So he hits the water and uh, basically, and I cannot imagine... Uh, being swallowed, it, it may, to me, it makes the Jaws movie look like a cartoon, okay? I mean, this is real life stuff. He looks up and this huge fish and this tongue hits his face <laughs> like that. I mean, it's crazy, folks. And uh, I'll, I'll get into that later on. Hebrews chapter 12, and, and we're finished. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, verse 5. And you, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. Folks, we're, we're, we're sons and we're children 
of God. And no matter how much we disobey, no matter, and again, I'm not trying to say, hey, just sin all you want and things will be fine. That's not what I mean at all. We are going to sin. And the key is not staying there. The key is not making peace with sin. The key is not justifying your sin. We're going to sin. And, and God is going to chastise people because of their sin. But He gives you the reason right here in Scripture. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by Him. For whom the Lord loves, He chastens. If He wasn't disciplining you, that would be a good sign that you're not even saved. If you can go out and you can live your life, and you don't care about sin, you don't care how it affects anybody else, all that, there is a good, because conviction of sin is one of the good, main reasons you can know that you're saved. So, you know, uh, conviction is a good thing, and he does it. He rebukes us because he loves us. Why do we discipline children? Why? Because they're, they're young. They don't know. They can't make decisions at age four and five. And I tell you, and, and it's in the school system, folks, I'm just telling you, when we took discipline and the Bible and prayer out of school, I'm just telling you, it affects everything. It really does. That discipline that God has us uh, is, is for us, and he does it because he loves us and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, Verse 7, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom the Father does not chasten? I mean, discipline, and, and if there's anybody that knew about discipline, it was me and my father. Folks, he didn't play, all right? I wished we'd have had time out back then. But I still don't think I would have been who I am. I mean, literally, uh, my father put the fear of God in me at times. And I understand we shouldn't discipline in anger. I'm not saying he did it uh, the right way all the time. But folks, discipline from God is for our own good. And sometimes it is harsh. Okay? It's not easy. It's not light. Okay? But he's doing it to drive us closer to him and to understand what, what we did was wrong. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Folks, illegitimate means you're lost. Okay, If you can just live any lifestyle and you're not under conviction and you call yourself a Christian, uh, folks, I mean, there are things such as uh, false professions of faith. Matthew chapter 7 uh, speaks of that. And then furthermore, we have human fathers who corrected us, which I was talking about, and we paid them respect. <laughs> One of the things my dad said to me one time, I brought you into this world and I'll take you out if I have to. All right, I was getting older. I wasn't a child back then. And I'm telling you, I thought he meant it. I thought he meant it. I really did. Not that he's going to kill me, but it, it would be as if you are going to regret this. And most of the time is if you don't shut your mouth. All right. And then he says, uh, shall we not uh, much more readily be in subjection to the Father of the spirits, and live. And folks, the, the spirits is the Holy Spirit. If we would just come under uh, the authority of the Holy Spirit, it would save us a lot of trouble. Verse 10, For they indeed uh, for a few days chasten us, as it seems best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like, you know, Flip Wilson the devil made me do it. Well, folks, the devil can't make you do anything. The devil tempts you, and you decide to do it. I, I've heard the phrase, even my growing up, you know, go get the switch. I'm going to beat the devil out of you. All right? And, and so it's, it's for a reason. And that word right there is the whole word in what our parents were trying to teach us and what God's trying to teach us, holiness. You are God's child. People are watching you. Uh, we need the discipline of God in our lives. And you think of life in general. If you just think of life in general, folks, it's all about discipline. Are you disciplined in your reading of the Bible? Are you disciplined in obeying 
the Word of God? Are you disciplined in your prayer life? All that affects your relationship with God. And then it says, now no chastening seems uh, joyful to the present, but painful. <laughs> and my mom always said, this, he, she'd be whipping me with a belt. And I like belts compared to some of the other things I was whipped with. All right, razor straps. I got it with a water hose one time in the yard. Uh, and she'd say, this hurts me more than you. And I'd always say, well, then quit. We'll both be happy. All right. At the time, they don't think that. But uh, it is painful, but it, it drives home. Uh, something in our lives. Nevertheless, here's it. Afterwards, it yields peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. All right? How do you break a horse? How do you train animals? Okay? And again, I'm not into beating animals, but I'm just telling you, uh, you know, riding a horse, you got to get on it. You're going to get thrown off. You got to get back on it. All right? You just have to do it. You have to go over and over and over again. And I will say this. This is the bottom line of this first chapter. Being out of the will of God is a miserable existence for a child of God. Being out of the will of God, it's miserable uh, for a child of God. And I, we're out of time. I was going to tell another story but we'll save it for later. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I have, I, I have been out of your will. It's been a, it's been a while. Uh, but God, I thank you that uh, you, you brought me back, Lord. And uh, Lord, I thank you that you spoke to me, clearly spoke to me. And uh, God, it's just so much more fun. And there's so much joy in life and fulfillment and uh, just joy of of knowing that we're in the will of God. And Lord, I, I know uh, there are Christians that are just running. And God, I pray they'd just stop. I really do. I pray that they would repent, that, that turnaround, that change. And God, I pray that they would just run to you. So God, thank you for Jonah. And Lord, I just, I just think of all, there's many stories of that. I think of Peter uh, denying Christ, uh, but yet he restored him and God, we just thank you for that. So, Lord, just help us to realize that we have to stay close to God. We have to have communion with God. We need fellowship with God. We need to pray with God. We need to be in his word so that we can listen to the voice of God. And God, when it comes to your will, I pray that we won't mull over it. I pray we won't do surveys with people. I pray that we would just get with you. And then in our heart of hearts, uh, we would know the perfect will of God. Lord, you're not hiding from us. Uh, you're not, you know, uh, punishing us uh, just for one reason, Lord. Uh, Lord, discipline is, is for a good reason, uh, and it's for, for holiness. So, God, I pray that we would all just do some introspecting and look at our lives and look at we, where we are with you. And God, I pray that we would just not run from you, but run towards you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.